Good to have you here with us, Lester. Your beautiful family there. Awesome. I know you're blessed. I know you're happy, man. Right? Yeah. And others that are joining us this morning. It's good to see everybody. We are going through a series this summer on First and Second Thessalonians, the first letters that Paul wrote um, when he started after he'd started his ministry. This is on his second missionary journey, and he's in a town called Thessalonica. Or Thessaloniki, you might hear it pronounced sometimes. And he was only there for about three weeks, sharing the gospel, and had a lot of people come to Christ in that process, so much so that the, uh, the Jews and the wealthy Gentiles of the community got a little jealous and stirred up a, an insurrection against Paul and created a riot, and I mean, it got pretty gnarly. And the, the Christians who were living there... Uh, un, began to endure some pretty heavy persecution, only being three weeks old in the Lord. You know, and I've asked the question before, but can you imagine that? Only being new to the faith for about three weeks, and all of a sudden, everybody wants to hurt you and take what you got and diminish you and shut your mouth up. I mean, it, it got nasty for those folks. So we went through chapter 1, chapter 2, 3, and 4. Today, we are finishing up 1 Thessalonians. It was written in 51 A.D., Paul wrote it while he was presumably in Athens or Corinth. We're not quite sure. We just know that from one of those cities, he wrote this letter and sent after Timothy had come back with a report as to how well the church in Thessalonica was doing. Okay. So the opening part of chapter 5 continues Paul's instructions on the coming of the Lord. Remember that chapter 4 ends, and, and by the way, let me, let me just kind of point this out. In the original manuscripts of the New Testament, there were no chapter numbers, no verse numbers. Here's what the New Testament looked like. Imagine your favorite book in your head right now, a book you've read. Turn all of the letters into capitals. Remove all the punctuation. No periods, no commas, no semicolons, no question marks. Remove all the punctuation. Everything's just capital letters. Now remove all the spaces. And from chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 1, to the last letter of chapter 2, the book is one long continuous thread of letters. That's it. That's what the New Testament looked like for the first 900 years it existed. You know, we didn't add chapter and verse numbers until the 15th century. All, so that's all arbitrary. So feel free to re kind of organize the scriptures in a way that makes sense. Because to me, the first part of chapter 5 should be part of conti the continuation of, of four, chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, where Paul's talking about the coming of the Lord and the dead in Christ rising, because chapter 5 continues his idea on the return of Christ. Okay, so have that, that kind of point of reference as we jump into chapter 5 now, that Paul is continuing to talk about the coming of the Lord and the day of the Lord that is going to be coming upon the earth. Remember in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, he clears up some misunderstandings that the Thessalonians had about death because from their pagan background, they believed that death was final. There was no resurrection. There's no coming back from that. And now they were concerned that people that they had loved had died and Jesus hadn't come back yet, so what's going to happen to them, they were asking. Are we going to just going to lose them forever? Well, Paul said, no, here's what's going to happen. The Lord's going to descend with a mighty shout and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those of us who are alive and remain will be snatched up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. That's what's going to happen. They're not gone. They're temporarily not with us. Emphasis on the word temporarily. Amen? So Paul had to clear that up. In 4.17, uh, the, the, I used the word that they would, we would be caught up together with them. The Greek word for that is harpazo, and it literally means to snatch away with great violence. Imagine somebody being kidnapped. So when Jesus comes back, he's coming back, and he, is gonna, he wants us. He's going to snatch us up in a good way, right? The Latin word for that is raptare, from which we get the word rapture. 
That's where, the, that's where that whole idea of the rapture comes from, that catching away, that when Jesus comes, he's, gonna, he's snatching to come here. You're mine. I paid for you. I bought you. We finally get to be together. And as we move towards the founding of his kingdom on the earth. And so what was going on in Thessalonica, uh, there were people who were saying, well, he's already come. And we missed it. Or he's going to come on such and such a date. You know, and so and, and it was creating a lot of confusion in this church. And just as in our time, there were those in Paul's time who tried to pin down the exact day of Jesus' return. Okay, that's a foolhardy, that's a foolhardy venture, folks. Don't. It's, it doesn't work. Here's some examples. Hippolytus of Rome and, and, and a guy by the name of Sextus Julius Africanus. And even Irenaeus, who was a disciple of, he was kind of like a grandchild in the faith of the Apostle John, they all predicted Jesus would come back in 500 AD. They were first, second century persons, and they thought, nope, he'll be coming back in 500. They based that on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Okay, well, that's interesting. Then there was Beatus of Labana, who predicted that he would come back April 6, 793 A.D., now, if, you're, if you love history, and I do, you, know, you recognize that date. That the, the, the tri that he predicted the Great Tribulation be began that day, and Jesus would be coming back within the seven-year period marked in the Bible. That was the day that Ragnar Lothbrok, the Vikings, sacked Lindisfarne, the Abbey, the Abbey in Lindisfarne, England and started that whole Viking incursion that just terrified all of Europe for the next three, four hundred years. That's the date that started. They saw the Vikings as evidence of the return of Christ. The whole world is being torn apart now by these marauders who have no mercy, no, no sense of humanity. We're all dead. That was the thought. And so he predicted seven years after that, that happened at Lindisfarne, that, the, that, that Viking incursion, that uh, Jesus would come back. Well, didn't happen. Then there was the German reformer and mathematician, Michael Stiefel, who predicted Jesus would come back at 8 o'clock in the morning, October 19th, 1533. That didn't happen. Then Johanna Southcott, who was a 64-year-old self-proclaimed prophet, said she was pregnant with the Christ child, who would be born December 25th, 1814. Now, what was going on between England and America in 1814? The war. So they, they interpret all the chaos that was coming out of the war, of what we call the War of 1812, they were attributed all of that to the second coming of Christ. Needless to say, it didn't happen, and... She actually died on the, the exact day she predicted Jesus would be born from her. And when she, they autopsied her, and she was not pregnant. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, predicted Christ would come in 1836. So the evangelical camp isn't immune to this, right? Charles Taze Russell, who was the first president of what is now the Watchtower Society or the Jehovah's Witnesses, predicted Jesus would return in 1874. In 1835, Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, predicted that Jesus would return in 1891. That date has been adjusted as the, the new date comes and goes through history. So they, there is a date they predicted. So I don't, I'm not sure what it is today. But when that date comes and goes, they'll, oh, well, the prophet now has revealed a new date. In our own lifetime, some of you might remember Herbert W. Armstrong. It was kind of an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist. He predicted Christ would come in 1935, then 1943, then 1972, and then 1975. And he quit doing it after that. And he died in 1986. A movement within the Seventh-day Adventist predict, uh, that called the, uh, they predicted that in 18, 1964 Jesus would return because it was 120 years after what they call the Great Disappointment. Because William Miller, who was one of the, uh, he was a Baptist preacher who was part of that Seventh-day Adventist camp, predicted Christ would come in October of 1944. 
And when it didn't happen, they said, oh, that's when we count, that starts the countdown of 120 years because when God told Noah to build the boat, it was 120 years until the flood. So from that time to 124 year, 120 years later, that's when Jesus will come. 8, 1964. Well, 1964 is a long time ago now. 1844 is when the initial prediction was. They said 120 years later is when Jesus would come. Hal Lindsey, and I've read this book, Late Great Planet Earth, he suggests Jesus would come back in 1988. This was 1970. Edgar Wisenant, you probably remember this one, wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. When that didn't happen, he wrote a follow-up book called 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1989. <laughs> Yeah, so that didn't, that didn't happen either. Other dates that have predict, been predicted recent, in recent history, 1999, 2000. Remember Y2K and the big hubbub that, that all was all, all the people that got, oh, it's the year 2000, all our computers are going to go down, the Antichrist is going to rise and Jesus is going to come back. It's like our hair's on fire, you know. 2011, 2012, 2015, 2019, 2020, 2021. All these have, are years given by various prognosticators, some of them well-known, some of them not so well-known, as to when Jesus would come back. Every one of these people ignored what Jesus said. And we need to remember what Jesus said. In Matthew 24, 26, he said this, but about the day or hour, no one knows, period. As soon as somebody says to you, I know when Jesus is coming back, walk away. Jesus said, nobody knows. He didn't even know. Only the Father in heaven knows the time he's going to send his son back. Okay? So, Paul, that's the first thing Paul dealing with. Hey, don't worry about it. Of the day, of the times and seasons, we told you about all this. Don't get caught up with all that stuff. Okay? And Paul must have spent significant time on this topic because he, in, in the opening chapter, we're going to look at that here in a second, he did not feel the need to address this issue that we just talked about. So starting in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, Paul says this to the Thessalonians. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, some translations will say times and seasons, that's the same idea, concerning certain periods of time, certain events, whatever, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come, how? Like a thief in the night. Do you have on your calendar the exact date and time a thief's going to raid your house? Have you planned that? Probably not. And just like a thief who breaks into your house to steal from you, Jesus is coming back with that kind of unpredictability at a time when people least expect it. And while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So, this, so in, in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Paul talks about this, this snatching away of the church. The dead in Christ rising, right? And us who are alive and remain being taken up with them. This is a different event than this day of the Lord thing being talked about here in 1 Thessalonians 5. This is a completely separate event. Somewhat connected, in the, in the, in the, perhaps in the Bible uh, timeline and scheme of things, but not the same event. One of the things that's, that we're headed towards, and we know this, that that with all the chaos in the world, there are very loud and vocal voices now um, crying out for a global one world government, one world religion, one world economy that will remove all of the conflict from the human race and will have peace on earth. You know, that's even part of the charter of the United Nations. You know, not necessarily in the, the, the charter, not necessarily to be that one world, but that's, that's what we're being propelled towards. 
Because people are screaming, they're crying out for peace and safety, and a time is coming where a false peace and a false sense of security, we're going we're to have that. And I believe, and this is just me, that leading up to that, there's going to be in so much chaos on the earth that when the peace and safety comes, people are going to embrace it with no questions asked. You know, and Paul is, is talking about this time, and we'll, we'll, we'll see that develop even more in the next epistle in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 when we go through that. But this, this whole, the, the, the cry for peace and safety, they will, people will be glad to give up personal freedoms and liberties for the sake of peace and safety. You know. And Jesus said it's going it's, to, and when that happens, and they, that all of a sudden destruction is going to come upon them like a woman going into labor. Yeah. There is a time, Paul says, of reckoning coming on a global scale as there once was in the days of Noah. You know, Jesus himself said that and even used that as an analogy. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the, in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So, right? But he goes on to say, verses 4 through 7 now, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day, that day of the Lord, and we're going to develop that in a moment, should surprise you like a thief. It should not surprise us. You are all children of the light and children of the day. Hmm? We're God's flower kit children. Children of the light, children of the day. We're not, we're not stumbling around in dark, darkness. Right? We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let's not be like others. Let's not live the way people who live in darkness are living. He, go, he says, verse 6, who are, let's not live like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. You know, there's a time, and in 2 Thessalonians, when we get there, Paul talks about this a little more, so I'm not going to develop it too much. But there is a time coming, and Paul hints at this just a little bit, where there's going to be a massive falling away of people from the faith. It's called the great apostasy. That the, Jesus said that he warned that, as, that the, the, as people, as we got closer to the end, that the love of many, people who loved him, the love of many will grow cold and many will be offended because of him and withdraw. So there's a falling away coming, you know, that, that is part of what we can expect to see happen as we get closer to the coming of Christ. Yeah. But we're not those who sleep. We're, we're children of the light, Paul says. Walk in the light. Stay there. Remain in the light. Verse five, verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 8. But since we belong to the day, and, and this is uh, leading up to what um, Leonard read for us this morning, but since we belong to the day, the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. There's those words again. Faith, hope, and love. Yeah. We saw that in chapter 1. Paul Paul looked at the Thessalonians and said, you're, the, the work you're doing produced by your faith, the love that you have for one another, the hope that you have in Christ. He was just thrilled that those things existed in this very young church at that time. And here we see these, this faith, hope, and love coming up again in, this, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. Let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. What else can we see Paul beginning to move and develop here? Are you catching it? And the hope of salvation as a helmet? Who said something over here? What, what else is he developing? Can you see the beginnings of the whole, his whole de, the development of the armor of God in, in Ephesians chapter 6? Now remember, these are the first letters he wrote. So these are ideas that are part of, who, of, part of his teaching and, and, and symbols that he uses to help the Christians understand you know, how the kingdom of God works. And by the t about 15, 20 years later, when we get to Ephesians, when Ephesians is written, um, 15, about 10, he, uh, he has really developed out that idea of the armor of God, right? 
And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now these three remain. All You can argue about all the gifts you want and all that goofy stuff you're getting into, but here are the three things that matter. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Right? So we see all in, in, in Paul's addressing the church here that this is central to his message. This idea of putting on armor to protect ourselves, drawing from the imagery of his time. These three essential ingredients to a, a healthy, whole faith and healthy relationships in the context of the body of Christ, faith, hope, and love. These are central ideas of his that never change throughout his ministry. We see them popping up again and again and de being developed more and more and more as he, as he goes along. I think that says something to us, that these are things we should be focusing on, right? The developing of faith, hope, and love, considering the armor that God has given us to put, put ourselves on. If he were alive today, he, would, might, he might say, put on your helmet and your camcorder, you know. Grab, pick up the, the M16 of the Spirit. Yeah, he's using imagery that was relevant to his time. Right? Then he goes on, and this takes us to, we're going to talk more about that day of the Lord. When he talked about the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night, he develops this, and more. He develops this idea and talks about a day of wrath that is coming. In chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, Look at your neighbor and say amen. God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. You and I, as believers in Christ, will never be the object of God's ire. Ever. Think about that for a second. He's never going to look over his glasses at you. Right? Right? We're not the objects of his wrath. We have been appointed instead to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we didn't fall into it. It was appointed. Isn't that cool? You and I will never know the wrath of God experientially. We will see it when he pours it out on the world, but you and I will never be the objects of his wrath because he poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross for us. The wrath he had in store for you, he poured out on his own son. That's one of the wonderful truths of the gospel and one of the mysteries to me. It's a mystery, but it's the truth. He died for us that whether we are awake or asleep, Paul says, we may live together with him, whether we are awake, physically alive, or we sleep, we're physically dead, doesn't matter. We will be together with him. Amen? So there is a day of God's judgment and wrath coming. In Revelation chapter 6, we see a picture of this that is so terrible that the people cry out, begging the rocks to fall on them, to hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. By this time, humanity is understanding what they're up against. At least in the book of Revelation there. Hide us from him who sits on the throne. You know, begging the rocks to crush them and hide them because of the, fierce, the fierceness of God's judgment that is coming. But God hasn't appointed us to that wrath. He protects his own from judgment. You know, think about Noah. When, when God had had, had enough with, the, with that, the, the, what we call the antediluvian world, the world before the flood, when he'd had enough, he found one person who was righteous before him and said, okay, you have 120 years, build a boat. Make it this long, this wide, this high, put three levels in it, and I'm going to bring two of all the different animals and seven of the clean animals to you, and you're going to load yourself in the boat, and I'm going to destroy the world. And it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. And Peter says that while he was building it, he was a preacher of righteousness. He was warning the world around him. Judgment's coming. A day is coming, a day of reckoning. We're not going to get away from it. It is coming upon the world. And it came after Noah and his family and the animals were safe in the ark. God himself shutting the door. Right? Lot and Sodom. 
Abraham's nephew Lot lived in the city of Sodom. Sodom was a wicked, wicked city. And a couple of angels come by, and Abraham sees them. They're on their way to Sodom and says, we're going... And he says, come on, let's have some tea and coffee. You know, some coffee or donuts or whatever they had at the time. And he said, what are you guys up to? He said, well, we're going to Sodom to destroy it. And, and, and Abraham says, well, my, my nephew's there. If, if you find 50, 50 good people, 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? And the angel, of, the angel of the Lord said, yes, we'll spare the city if there are 50. How about 40? Yeah, we'll spare the city if there's 40. 30? Mm-hmm. Well, this is thing, there's just 20. Yeah, we'll, we'll spare the city. How about 10? Just give me that. The angel said, yeah, we'll spare it. There's 10, pe- 10 righteous people there. So the, angel, the angels went in. They stayed with, in, in Lot's house overnight, took them to the, ed- the edge of the city the next day, said, run, don't stop, don't look back. Get out of the city because we cannot destroy this city and it wasn't just Sodom, it was, there were five cities that they overthrew. We can't destroy the city until you are safe. So God takes his own out of the way of his judgment. We will be removed before judgment can fall on the earth. The day of the Lord is a season of judgment that ends with Jesus establishing his kingdom on earth. That's the good news. I mean, we look at the day of the Lord and it's like, holy cow, this is going to be awful. Yes, for some, for the world and its systems, but at the end of it, King Jesus will sit on a throne in Jerusalem. That's what's coming. And peace and righteousness will fill the earth. And men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. That's what's coming. And it's going to get crazy before it comes. And this, this wrath of this judgment and this wrath of God is going to be poured out first. Paul and the and Thessalonians knew this. Paul's reminding them. Some, some scriptures on that. Isaiah 13, 9. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. These are hard scripture. Yeah. Amos 5, 8, 18 rather. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will bring darkness, not light. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. You know, Don't become part of that Christian camp that's looking forward to the destruction of the unrighteous. Be in terror for them. Pray for them. Don't, you know, know, just wait, you'll see, you'll get yours. No, that's not the spirit of Christ. He died for them. He died for you and me. We were part of that camp. And it's only by grace that we've been saved, right? Right? Malachi 4.1, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day is coming, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. And then go back to Acts chapter 2. Those are all Old Testaments. Like, let's get out of the Old Testament. I like the, for God so loved the world, you know. That, that's, let's, let's talk about that instead. But here's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit, Holy Spirit was poured out, yeah, and the first evangelism crusade took place in Acts chapter 2, here's what Peter preached. He started by quoting from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. Now, it's a lengthy passage, and that's, that's just part of it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the first evangelistic sermon that he preached post-ascension Peter warned people of the day of the Lord he said the sun's going to be turned to blood that's that the great and terrible day is coming save yourself from this wicked generation those were his words on the first the first sermon after the resurrection of Christ the king is coming he's going to set up a new kingdom you don't want to be on the opposite side of his sword 
was essentially the warning. And 3,000 souls gave their hearts to Christ that day. Right? I invite you to read that. Read Acts chapter 2 and Joel chapter 2. Easy to remember because they're both two chapters. The second chapter of those books. Compare them. And look at how the Holy Spirit led Peter to preach that first message. We're gonna, I'm not going to spend more time on that because we're going to develop this in a lot more detail when we talk about 2 Thessalonians 2 a few weeks from now. So let's continue. Chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. He, that's Jesus, died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another, and build each other up. These words that Paul's sharing with us, while they're heavy, they're meant to be words of encouragement. Right? We can take courage and remember all the the terrible stuff that was happening to the Thessalonian church. It's it's, it's coming. We'll, We'll see some of that stuff in our time, probably. You know? The Bible has been removed from some schools in Utah now because it contains vulgarity and violence. YouTube is, is now, uh, you know, anybody know John MacArthur, the, the, the preacher John MacArthur, right? A number of his sermons have been removed from YouTube because they contain hate speech. And there's a movement to get the Bible labeled as hate speech, which means those who adhere to its teachings just heads up, you know, heads up. We live in a culture that doesn't like Jesus and it's becoming more and more and more apparent. But that's okay. The Thessalonians went through it. You know, other periods of time, Christians have gone through dealing with the, the spirit of Antichrist. First, next chap, the, the next book in Thessalonians talks about that. We will weather our storm by the grace of God. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. And then he gives some final admonitions, and I'm going to go through these really quickly. In verses 5 to 12, in chapter 5, 12 to 13, he says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, who admonish you, hold them in highest regard and love because of their work. And he's talking about the elders and the deacons, and those who teach and, and, and teach your kids and proclaim the word of God and, and help to keep the church moving. And, and I know our board doesn't like this, but I'm doing it anyway. Would you stand? I want our board to stand. These people have been selected by you and, and entrusted. Go ahead. Come on. You know who you are. All right. And let's give some honor to them. These are the people that Paul's talking about right here. Shay, I want you to stand up. Eddie, Emma, Paula Shaver, right? Paula Shagley. All those who contribute time, talent, treasure to help our church move forward and to, bring, to make our ministry strong. Leonard, you're one of those servants, brother. You contribute so much, you, and he doesn't even know it, right? Because that's who he is. But that, that's, this, is what, this is who Paul says to honor. So we honor, we want to honor that. Elders, deacons, pastors, those who God has raised up. Then he goes on in the second part of 13. He says, live in peace with each other. Any commentary needed? Live in peace with each other. Pursue peace, Hebrews 12, 14. Make effort, every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then 5, 14. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive... Encourage the disheartened, the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Okay, deep breath. Be patient with everyone. Everyone means who? Everyone. Right? Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. If somebody wrongs you, give it to the Lord. You know, keep your focus on what's good, what's, what's wholesome, what's going to continue to inc- build unity in, our, in the church body. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. All right, now we're going to memorize two passages of Scripture right now. 
1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Ready? Rejoice always. Rejoice always. That's all it is. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. So what does 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 say? Rejoice always. Okay, see, you got that one memorized. There we go. The next one. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray continually. Okay, so what does 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 say? And what does 5, 16 say? See there, you memorized two passages of Scripture today. Give yourself a pat on the back. Now do this. Rejoice always simply just means to constantly in your heart frame everything going on in your life in the context of your relationship with God. That will bring a cause for rejoice. And praying continually doesn't mean going and getting on your knees for 19 hours a day and praying. It means being in a state of the awareness of God's presence in your life continually and living like that where you hear his voice speaking to you and you're having these ongoing conversations with him all day. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, right? Pray continually. Rejoice always. 518, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will concerning you in Christ Jesus. That giving thanks part can only happen if we're rejoicing always and praying continually. Now we can give thanks because we have a framework from which to do it. Right? Our hearts are in our hearts, we're rejoicing and we're connecting with the Lord. So, yes, I can be thankful. I can be grateful, even when stuff is happening in my life that I don't really want to feel grateful for. I can trust God's purposes. Concerning the Holy Spirit, Paul goes on 5 19 and 22. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. This thought we will develop further next month. And then finally, Paul's benediction. And I'll be doing my own shortly so the worship team can come up at this point. Paul says this, verses 23 to 24, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. The one who saved us continues to save us. The one who sanctifies us or sanctified us continues to sanctify us. And the one who calls us is faithful. Isn't that, isn't that great that none of this depends on me? That I have to live up and perform to some measure or expectation that God has before I can enjoy the the privilege of being called his child? If it depended on me, it'd be over, folks. A long time ago. Yeah. Verses 25 to 26, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all of God's people with a holy kiss, which is one of the reasons why we have our greeting time on Sunday mornings. It's an opportunity to shake hands. We don't kiss each other. You know. Buddy came at me with puckered lips one day, and I said, no, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> no, right? No, but in Paul, in, in, in the first century, that's what they did. The, the, the double kiss on the cheek, which is still a very European thing, that was their greeting. Greet each other with a holy handshake, too. You know, arm around the shoulder. You know, the point is, remember, we're a family, Right? I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. Mission accomplished. We read the entirety of 1 Thessalonians 5 in the last six weeks. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Worship team, come on up.